Alright, today is Sunday, March 20th. This is a recap for the stock market activities last week and an outlook for the week to come. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight, but how about rebound week? The bull market is back, right? Forget about the Fed, forget about Powell, forget about Russia, Ukraine, who cares about anything? We're back, baby. Call options, blindfolds on, running Naruto style, heads first, buy first, ask questions later. Matter of fact, don't ask questions at all. All your horses not too fast. Why was the rebound exaggerated throughout the week? There are technical reasons, there are psychological reasons, there are market mechanics reasons, and this is one of them. It was Triple Witching Friday, and this will exaggerate things one way or the other. And by now, you might be aware that it was the biggest Triple Witching Friday in the history of the stock market. So what happened? Friday marks the largest Triple Witching Day in memory, with three and a half trillion dollars in options set to expire with more near-the-money options maturing than at, at any time since 2019. Wow. Now, take a guess when they say $3.5 trillion near the money. Are they talking about calls or puts? The answer is puts because people have been buying puts since the beginning of the year with the expiration date of last Friday. And the market went down significantly. A lot of these puts were in the money. So what happens a few days before expiration? The psychology kicks in and we see a lot of these shorts covering and booking profits right away before they get squeezed on Friday. And then when Friday comes, the market maker, who sold these puts, we're talking about billions if not trillions of dollars worth of puts. If these puts are in the money, the market maker has to buy all of these underlying stocks. Be it the SPY, the Qs, individual stocks, doesn't matter because these put options will be exercised and if they don't, they have to hedge anyways by buying the underlying stock. And therefore, we got the massive move to the upside, the rebound that we got throughout the week, but specifically on Friday, impulsively so because we have market mechanics reasons to driving the rebound, which could prove, by the way, at the end of the day, that it was nothing mere but a bull trap. We'll see. The growing popularity of options is seen putting additional focus on the quarterly expiration events. Options influence has grown dramatically since the pandemic began and has been exaggerating equity movements in both directions. Today could be especially colorful in this arena. By today means Friday, this is all news. But now you know. And here it is, global equities, the best week since 2020. Massive pop higher. The S&P 500, the best week of the year so far. We're talking about a gain of almost 6% in a matter of a week. What does that mean? It means that in all likelihood, we're going to have a pullback. Could be Monday, could be Tuesday. But the longer they keep pumping the stock market higher, the bigger the pullback. And of course, the retail crowd, they've been dumping Tesla and NVIDIA, and they've been buying what? Garbage. No, just kidding. They've been buying tech. They've been buying ETFs. They've been buying oil. They're all over the place. But taking profits from Tesla and NVIDIA is an important move. These two happen to be the retail crowd's favorite names. And they're going to be the last blocks to fall, Apple, NVIDIA, Tesla. The reason is the retail crowd will not give up until it's over. But for now, after this massive rebound, is the bottom in at least for a few weeks, maybe months, or is it going to be a bull trap? Technically speaking, looking at the charts, it looks like we have a bottom at least for a few weeks. The problem is, what drove the insane action, the massive rebound higher? We're talking about market mechanics. We're talking about short covering. We're talking about algos. We're not talking about legitimate buying by the retail crowd or the institutionals. Legitimate strategic positioning in the stock market, let's say for the next quarter. We're not seeing that yet keyword yet. So we continue to be skeptical about the rebound. And now we have Goldman Sachs saying perhaps the market went a little over its head and relaxed a bit too much over the Russia-Ukraine war. What are they talking about? On the surface, the gains in equities and fall in commodity prices might seem unusual, given that there is no sign of the Ukraine war ending. And according to Goldman Sachs analysts, there are signs investors may have gotten too optimistic. And they provide this chart. Let's grab, for example, the Russell 2000 or the S&P 500. Doesn't matter. The Nasdaq. You can pick whatever you want. At the peak of the panic last month, you see these little squares 
the red squares. This was the assets positioning during the peak of the panic, the peak of the selling. And even with that, we haven't crossed the threshold where according to Goldman Sachs, we see assets pricing more risk. So all of you who say, hey, when everybody's fearful, you gotta buy, yada, yada, yada. The market is becoming too bearish. Everybody's panicking, peak fear, etc., etc. Not really, at least according to this indicator. We have a long way to go. And last week, the assets positioning was actually signaling less risk meaning risk on so again there is no peak panic peak fear everybody's fearful on the contrary everybody's waiting to buy the dip everybody's saying that the russia ukraine war yeah it might be a big deal but at the end of the day the stock market is going to go higher this is delusional folks anything could go wrong in this war there was a lot of pressure for example in the biden administration to send the migs to Ukraine. What if he finally buckles and says, you know what, we're sending the MiGs. We're seeing all these horrible pictures on TV. There are a lot of emotions being attached here, but we say, okay, we'll send the MiGs. What if the MiGs are stationed in Poland, ready to be flown into Ukraine? The Russians spot that on the radar, on the satellite images, and they decide to bomb all these planes inside Poland's borders. What happens then? Did anybody ask this question at all? Continuing. This points to a significant relaxation in the market's assessment of the global implications of the Ukraine invasion, said uh, somebody who cares. While many assets could shift further to our upside case, they are now more vulnerable if progress toward a resolution proves fleeting or if energy supplies are disruptly more severely. Here's another one, a little scarier, so grab another diaper if you've already shit your pants based on the Goldman Sachs note, because we have another group of analysts who say the stock market faces a lost decade of zero returns through 2031. Uh-oh. What are they talking about? Here it is. Instead of the S&P 500s, hundreds, hundred, whatever it is, compounded annual rate of return of more than 13% during the 2010s, investors should prepare the likelihood of a lost decade ahead, just like Japan, or returns of 0% in the US stock market from the end of 2021 through the end of 2031. So all of you Gen Zers out there, you're f***ed. And he bases his case on this. Over two centuries, 20-year returns in the stock market have always been positive in both real and nominal terms. But over 10 years, you could lose money. He provides the chart right here going back to 1822. And we have cycles, folks. Bull markets last for a little while. Then we take a downturn and we have a not-so-hot-so market, perhaps a bear market, perhaps a market where we have zero returns for a decade, a lost decade. It happened in Japan, could happen here. And this guy gives more reasoning behind the call. Bannister's outlook for poor stock market returns ahead is driven by elevated valuations metrics, a local high in the percentage of stock ownership among households, meaning you and I, as well as the potential for serious geopolitical risks. Some of this has already started to play out in 2022 with Russia's attack against Ukraine, raising geopolitical tensions to new highs. The invasion has led to an exacerbation of supply chain disruptions and massive price rises in everything from wheat to oil to nickel. He also said, I would say that the locking up of Russian reserves was as big of a watershed moment as when Nixon got the US off the gold standard in 1971. This told the world that they need to find alternative reserve currencies or their assets. Here's somebody who knows what they're talking about. If Bannister's view is correct, that could strengthen foreign currencies like the Chinese Yuan at the expense of the US dollar. Geopolitical tensions could get even worse if China invades Taiwan, which Bannister believes is a given. Pay attention now. I just made a video about China, by the way. Xi Jinping is not going to die without making a try for Taiwan, Bannister said, noting that the Noting that given his current age, a move against Taiwan is likely to happen by the end of this decade. And on top of that, Iran is likely to resurface as a geopolitical hotspot in the 2020s, according to Bannister. So how can investors eke out positive returns over the next decade? And this is important, so pay attention. According to Bannister, Simply buying and holding the S&P 500, a strategy that has done remarkably well since 2009, is not the answer. Bingo. All of these lazy bums, the fake profits, false profits, whatever they are, who pretend to be some genius hedge fund managers or some genius money managers for clients, all what they've been doing so far is riding 
the Fed's wave of liquidity, the cocaine ride, the easiest ride in the history of financial markets. All you have to do is buy an ETF and go to sleep until the Fed changes the policy. But now, this strategy is not going to work anymore because we will see the disaster of ETFization of this market, which I thought it was a disaster from the get-go. It's the dumbest idea ever. It removes away the talent of picking individual stocks. And it paved the way for this generation of lazy investors, lazy money managers, who buy ETFs and go to sleep. But the game is changing, baby, and now you gotta be a stock picker. So all of these fugazi money managers will be exposed. Do you know how to pick stocks or not? Buy and hold is the ideal strategy in the bull phases. But in the down phases, being in the index is not going to generate a positive return. Investors who are passive are going to suffer, Bannister said. Instead, listen to this, investors should allocate to real and alternative assets, including commodities, real estate, and the more active long short stock picking strategies, often employed by hedge funds. This is what I've been doing for years, the long short strategy. Within the equity space, Value stocks should outperform growth stocks, while international stocks are likely to outperform U.S. stocks, according to Bannister. In the short term, Bannister admits that there is room for upside in the S&P 500, with a potential relief rally to as high as 4,600. But those rallies, listen to this, but those rallies should be sold rather than bought, because, like in the aftermath of the dot-com bubble, a 20% counter-trend rally in the market is possible amid a broader downtrend. He provides his indicator here, it's like the Bollinger Bands, and every time we have an overshoot, that could last for years. But regardless, it is an indicator that we are at the end of the cycle, the end of the bullish cycle, and we're going down to the average, the same channel. With that being said, that could produce 25, 35, 50, even 60% correction from the top. But all in all, we're just going back to the same channel, the weighted average. Things got a little crazy, things got a little carried away, and we're now fixing this. And fixing it means that we're gonna have a big crash that will scare pretty much everybody off. And in this guy's opinion, it's gonna last for a decade, a lost decade. Thank you to the genius financial engineering by the criminals at the Federal Reserve. And with that note out of the way, let's move on to cover some charts and we start Start with SPY, the S&P 500 30 minutes chart. A massive impulsive rally to the upside. The problem is it is on lower than average volume, which is an indicator that the algos did a lot of the buying, short covering did a lot of the buying, but we're not seeing legitimate retail or institutional participation. For now, the chart, technically speaking, made a lot of progress. It recaptured 438. 443 and with that it has a lot of cushion before it falls back all the way to the line in the sand at around 430. So the bulls all in all made a lot of progress. Yes the rally is overextended perhaps a little overstretched on the technicals the RSI. What if we have a pullback all the way to 438? Is that going to change everything right now? Not really. How about we go down to 434? Still not a big deal, still buyable. How about 430? Okay, maybe a little steep, but we still have a bottom. We still have a double bottom at around 416. The moment you cross 430 and you lose that as support, then the diapers start to come out. So for now, my expectations, at least looking at this chart, it got a little ahead of itself in a short amount of time. We're gonna see a pullback. Is it gonna be to 438? That would be bullish if we have a rebound out of 438. 434, similar story, still bullish. When we go to 430, then we got a problem. So watch out for these levels carefully. Here is the daily chart for the SPY's continuous contract. We went all the way to 4,472, did not make it, but it's not a big deal. The momentum indicators improved dramatically over the week. The volume went down dramatically over the week. Again, a bullish sign, but it's also a sign for the lack of any institutional participation in the buying. Let's say we have a pullback this week, and we go down to 4,384.5. Is it a big deal? Not really. If we bounce from that point on, then you gotta buy, because that tells you right away the market has a bottom, and the market is making higher lows, and it is kind of reversing the bearish trend that started since the beginning of the year. But mind you, even the guy we listen to right now said we could have a rally all the way to 4,800, meaning going back all the way to the previous highs. But then the stock market is going to fall apart again. I doubt it. 
that we're going all the way back to 4,800. I think we're going to pull back right now. We'll see where the rebound is going to come from. And if it comes from 4,384 and a half, then the market is still bullish for now. If we go down to 4,232, then we got a problem. Then you get a question that perhaps we have another flush down coming. And by the way, here's the SPX, the cash index, the daily chart. Look at the 200 days moving average. We're going back to re-tag the 200 days moving average. Do you really think the chart's going to cross above the 200 days moving average that easy? I say not so fast. We're going to struggle. We could pull back from the 200 days moving average. It acts as a resistance for now. The problem is, if the market gets a little weaker after bumping at the 200 days moving average, and we're now back at 4,300, 4,200, then we're going back to 4,000. And in my opinion, at least in my professional opinion, I'm not comfortable buying here until I see 4,000 retested or a comfortable recapture of the 200 days moving average, meaning we climbed above the 200 days moving average and the chart retested the 200 days moving average as support over and over and over again. And it held. Absent of that, who's to say that this is just another bull trap? They're going to flush everybody down again. Here's the Qs, the NASDAQ, 30 minutes chart. Again, an impulsive rally, lower than average volume, lots of algos, lots of short covering, but technically speaking, a lot of progress for the bulls. And the reason is a weekly closing above 343 and almost a recapture of 352. Now, look at the RSI indicator. It is a little overstretched. This was a significant move in a short amount of time. You gotta have a pullback. What is the pullback, by the way, psychologically speaking? A lot of profit taking. A lot of folks, they hop on these oversold rallies, these oversold rebounds, bear market rebounds, whatever you want to call them. Doesn't matter to me. But they take profits quickly. And the assumption is, after a triple witching on Friday, they're gonna take some profits. We're gonna see some profit taking. And that could take us back all the way to 343. The problem starts if the Qs loses 343 as support on daily basis, but most importantly, on the weekly closing. And here's a daily chart for the continuous contract for the NASDAQ. We got 14,000 of support, at least for now, and the chart went all the way to 14,445, and it did not make it. Not a big deal. The momentum indicators improved dramatically. The volume remains a little below average. Good sign that the sellers are not showing up, at least for now, but a bad sign that the institutionals and the likes did not participate in the buying yet. If we have a pullback, and this is my expectation, by the way, if we get a pullback, if we go down to 14,000 and we have a rebound, and this is a solid buy the dip kind of rebound. If we go down to 13,599, then we got a problem and you got to be a little more careful buying the dip. Of course, what the bulls want to see is not another impulsive move higher or a drop below 14,000. The best case scenario for the bulls right now, and I've been saying this for a while, is consolidation for a little while. The consolidation for perhaps, let's say, days or weeks will give away the message that we have a bottom for now. So all of those bears who are betting that the market is going to crash right now, or we're going to make lower lows, they're going to be washed out. They're going to be tired and they'll give up. What is that going to pave the way for? More buyers to come. Once we have a solid, reliable bottom. But we're not going to know that if we have these impulsive rallies and pullbacks right away. We need some consolidation for a little while to get the comfort and the confidence that we have a bottom that we can work with at least for now. What about the IWM, the Russell 2000 small caps? Again, an impulsive rally higher, closing above 204 and a half. We're now looking at 208 as resistance, but you look at the RSI indicator, again, it is overbought a massive rally in a short amount of time. We're going to see some profit taking. Will 204 and a half hold if we have a pullback? If that is the case, then this is super bullish for the Russell 2000. But what happens if 204 and a half is broken? Are we going to go down all the way to 196 and a half? That would be a problem because the chart just erased pretty much all the gains. So what is the threshold here? 204 and a half. You start to close the day below that number, but we got a problem. Here's the weekly chart for the rut, the big Russell 2000. On the positive side, you look at the momentum indicators, they're curling, they're way higher as if they're bottoming. The problem is we are still in a bear flag pattern. The chart is still below the line in the sand at around 2100. But pay attention now because this chart will be a reliable leading indicator for the rest of the market. 
what am I talking about? If we have a weekly closing above 2100, then in all likelihood, the stock market will have either the consolidation that we've been talking about or another move higher, perhaps to 2200, 2300, and you don't want to miss on that. But if there is a failure at around 2100 and the chart struggles to break above that number, a matter of fact closes the week below this number after a rejection, then we get a problem. We got the abandoned ship, start shorting, we have another leg to the downside. Here's the Dixie, the dollar index. It pulled back, but I'm not convinced that this is over for the dollar. Why? Yes, we have negative divergences on both the RSI and MACD indicators, but we saw a massive sell-off in commodities. Why didn't we see the dollar also selling off aggressively, perhaps losing the support of 97? That degree of resiliency in charting behavior tells me that we're not done yet in the pop of the US dollar. We're not going to be done until 97 is lost to support. What about gold? What's going on with gold? Still holding, steady, nothing is going on here. A lot of the overbought technicals are now resolved. So if the buyers who are waiting in the sidelines show up, gold will continue to move higher. And my assumption is, with all of this uncertainty, do I buy the stock market? Do I buy the dip in the stock market? Or do I buy the dip in gold? In my opinion, you buy the dip in gold, not the stock market. Here's another important chart for UK oil, Brent, and we're looking at a four hours chart. We pointed out in this channel the bull flag pattern, and after that, a massive rally happened, almost a 50% rally since that point on in Brent. But then what happened? We saw a topping formation. You can look at it as a head and shoulder formation. You can look at it as a multiple bear flag formation. But what do we see now, regardless of all of this? We're seeing a double bottom for now. You can look at it this way. You could look at it another way. What if this is a cup and handle formation? A we have higher highs to go for gold, excuse me, for oil in this case. This is certainly a possibility, but we have a lot of resistance ahead. 120, even 115, we'll take it one step at a time. Let's see if these bullish formations, the double bottom, and the cup and handle work or not. Here's the chart, the daily chart for the 10 year yield. It looks as if it is topping. And my hunch is, we're going down. You're not going to leave a gap like this on a daily chart of the 10 year yield and just leave that open. You're going to go down to close that gap. And the chart might go down all the way to the support of 1.94. What will be the case for the 10 year yield moving down? In my opinion, a flare up in the Russia Ukraine tensions, or war, I should say. It doesn't appear that we're going to have a peace agreement, at least not for now, and things could get a lot worse. So, if we see commodities moving higher again, ironically, this chart could go down because the rise of commodities will happen due to a panic, and the panic will come hand in hand with buying bonds. Here's the weekly chart of the TLT. It looks like we have a reversal candle from a weekly perspective. This is a good sign, and it came on higher than average volume. It looks as of the momentum indicators are bottoming for now. The problem is the weekly closing was below 134 and a half. And this is weak, not strong. We can have an open mind and say, you know what? The TLT ran out of time. The weekly closing, triple witching. Let's give the TLT another chance at 134 and a half. It has to happen quickly, folks. We have to see a pop on Monday on the TLT and a drop in the 10 year yield. Otherwise, the inevitable will happen and this chart will go down to 128. What about the VIX four hours chart? We were looking at 24.29 as support. The VIX is getting a little oversold here in the RSI and the MACD indicator. We could see a reversal at around 24.29. The chart is a little below that, but it's not a big deal. It could rebound from that zone. My number is 24.29. Other numbers could be 24.25. It doesn't matter. But this is the zone where the VIX should rebound if it wants to. If there is a rebound in the VIX, the SPY is about to go down. The question is, will the VIX make it all the way above 33 again? That would be abandoned ship. Say goodbye, the SPY will flush down. But if we have a rebound, let's say to 27 and a half, and then the VIX starts to give up, then the SPY will go down to the support lines, perhaps maybe the first support line, and then we see a rebound right away. And that will be a solid, reliable rebound to buy. Here is the VXN 4 hours chart. It went down to 27.5, an important number to look for. Can we get a rebound from 27.5? I think so. It is a possibility. You look at the RSI, the MACD, they're all oversold right now. And if the VXN wants to stage a rebound rally, it could do from this point on, 27 and a half, which means we could see a pullback in the queues all the way to the line in the sand, and then we'll take it from there. If there is a rebound, 
So far, so good. If the line in the sand is violated and we have daily closing below that, 343, then we got a problem. And the VXN at that point will be above 35. Here's the daily chart for Apple. Perhaps a good sign for the Qs. We're seeing the momentum indicators reversing the negative divergence. We're seeing buying on higher than average volume for Apple. We're seeing a closing above 157. And we're now eyeing the upper range of the channel as resistance. So far, so good for Apple. The chart is looking beautiful for now. The problem is, you're still making lower lows and lower highs. And until that pattern is broken, this chart is not out of the woods yet. What about Tesla, the souffle and hourly chart? The rally went a little above my numbers, 866.14 and 886. A lot of options trades moving this chart, a lot of call options, a lot of puts being closed, a lot of buying of the stock. For those who sold puts, the problem is, it is getting a little overstretched in a short amount of time. And if the chart pulls back this time around, then we have the same lines, but most importantly, 866.14 and then 825.25. In my opinion, we'll see a pullback. If we have a rebound at around 866, that will be bullish. If we get down to 825.25, then we got a problem. What about tulips? BTC, no update, still struggling to break above the resistance at around 42,000. Once that happens and the chart breaks above the three amigos, the triple top, then we're talking. Talking. But for now, we're not doing anything at all. AMC, what's going on here? I closed my calls. I played the oversold bounce on the RSI. The pattern remains bullish for now. We have a cup and handle. It is above 14.24. You could juice a little more gains in this one. But after a significant rally in a short amount of time in the indices, if they pull back, it is almost a certainty that we're going to see a pullback in AMC. We've seen divergences before between the indices, GameStop, and AMC, but not recently. So why not book the gains and then take it from there? If we see a pullback, will 14.24 hold? If that is the case, then we will see a reattempt at 21 again, perhaps. And that merits buying some calls. If 14.24 is broken again, uh, time to grab a few more diapers and maybe a few more puts because we're going down. And with that, folks, let's move on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar this week? Monday, we have uh, Fed Zombie Boy Stick from Atlanta. We also have the Chicago Fed National Activity Index. And we have uh, Fed Zombie the Big Dog Powell speaking at somewhere. Who cares? Tuesday, we got nothing. Wednesday, we got new home sales. Thursday, we have the initial jobs claims for the week. We have durable goods, but most importantly, we have the manufacturing and services PMI. And lastly, on Friday, the most important day for the week, we will have the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index, the five-year inflation expectations. All of these are the final readings for the preliminary readings that we got before. And then we have the pending home sales index. Not a lot of activities on the macro calendar to distract the stock market one way or the other. So all concentration this week will be back on the Russia-Ukraine front and the inflation front. If we see oil, if we see palladium, wheat, nickel, aluminum exploding higher again, the stock market is not going to like it. But if we have stability in the commodities and then we have maybe more peace talks, just keep pushing the can down the road. We'll talk, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss, I'll call Putin, I'll call whatever, and the market is going to like it. But if it gets ugly and I have a hunch it's going to get ugly, unfortunately, we could see disruptions. So my advice is stick with the technicals. The names that ratted so high, so fast, will almost certainly have a pullback perhaps a severe one. Let's see where that stops and we'll take it from there. And with that, folks, I'm done here. This is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow.